Good morning, students. Let's take a look at our math for today. So take a look at this worksheet. We've done worksheets like this before that were slightly different. What would you guess that we're going to be doing just by looking at this worksheet here that we have seen similar ones before? Notice the operations that we have here. So basically what we're going to be doing is looking at different fact families, but instead of using um, addition and subtraction like we're used to using, we're going to be doing this with multiplication and division. So I'm going to do um, the first three with you guys, and then I'll have you guys fill out the last three here. So we're going to be dividing by three, by four, and by one, and then we also have a backside that we'll be looking at too. So just like we talked about with addition and subtraction, they undo each other and we have these fact families. And in these fact families, you're using the same numbers, right? But you're just moving them around, right? In addition, where does the biggest number go? It goes last, right? Because we take two numbers and we add them together to make an even bigger number that goes at the end. In subtraction, the bigger number usually goes where? usually comes first, right? Because we have a lot of items, right? And then we take some of them away. But the total is usually the biggest number that we have. Uh, it's going to be similar with multiplication and division, right? When we multiply, that's repeated addition. So where does the biggest number usually go in multiplication? At the end of the problem, after the equal sign, right? Because we have so many things and we're multiplying them to make an even greater number. What about for division? Where does the bigger number usually go? First, just like with subtraction, because when we're dividing, we have this large number of items and then we're making groups. And so we have the total, we know, and we're trying to figure out how many goes in each group or how many groups we're trying to make. So let's take a look at the facts that we have here. We have the biggest number on top, we have one of the numbers on the side, and we need to figure out what the other number is. So what could my multiplication problem be using a three and a 15? Well, let's go ahead and put the 15 at the bottom since we know that in multiplication, that's where the bigger number is going to go. And then 3 times what is going to give you 15? Right, 3 times 5 gives you 15. And so then what would my other equation be in my fact family? 5 times 3. And what do we call that property that tells us that you can switch these two numbers around and still get the same answer? the commutative property of multiplication, just like we have the commutative property of addition. Perfect. So notice, maybe you're a little confused by looking at this. What are we gonna do with this? What is this telling us to do? If we just have this line and I'm supposed to put a number on top and a number on the bottom. We're dividing, right? Notice here you have a different division sy symbol and then here you also have yet another division symbol. And we're just gonna practice using all of them. So now if I'm doing division, what number is going to go on top here? The 15, right? The biggest number is going to go on top. So we have 15 divided by which number comes next? Doesn't matter, right? We just take either of them and then we put the other one as the answer. 15 divided by 3 is 5. This means if I count by 3s 5 times, I'm going to get 15. So for this one, same thing, 15 is going to go at the top, but now I need to switch these two numbers around. 15 divided by 5 gives me 3. That means if I count by 5s 3 times, I would get 15, right? Or if I, sorry, if I count by 5s and I stop at 15, I would get 3 is my answer. I was telling you the multiplication way. It's kind of, um, can be a little bit confusing sometimes because some of us, when we do our division, we think about the multiplication way because that's faster for us. But it, they are different, right? Um, it just depends on what information that you have that allows you to do it that way. Let's take a look at the next one here. So now we have a 3 and a 21. So by looking at what we did here, where is the 21 going to go in our multiplication problem? At the end, right, the biggest number goes last in multiplication, and then 3 times what gives me 21 anyways? 7, right? So I have 3 times 7 equals 21. And then what do I do for the next one? I just flip these two numbers around. 7 times 3 gives me 21. Now when I'm doing division, what do I do here? What number comes first? 
21, right? The bigger number's gonna come first. And I can do 21 divided by three gives me seven, or 21 divided by seven gives me three. Have I added in, when I went from division, or sorry, when I went from multiplication to division, did I change any of the numbers that I had? No, right? I'm only using 7, 3, and 21. It's just the order of the numbers that's changing, right? So using all the same numbers for multiplication and division, if you know how to multiply, you know how to divide. Even if in your head you're thinking, no, I don't, I don't get it, right? You still do. You know how to, just like if you know how to add, you know how to subtract too. Because you know these fact families, okay? Let's take a look at one more together and then I'll have you guys do this part on your own following the same pattern. So we have a three and a 27. So where am I gonna put the big number for the multiplication problems? Underneath, right? 27 is our answer for the multiplication problem. And then three times what gives me 27? Three times nine, right? And you can figure that out on your fingers. You go nine times three, so I go to my third finger, one, two, three, put that finger down. The, the fingers in front of the finger that's down goes in the tens place. The fingers after the finger that's down goes in the ones place. So I have two in the tens place and a seven in the ones place. That gives me 27. So then what do I do here? I'm just gonna flip the numbers around. Nine times three gives me 27. Now using this division symbol, where does the big number go? Inside, right? The big number goes inside. So 27 is going to go underneath this little um, symbol here. And then what goes on the outside? Oh, and we forgot to write the 9 up here. Either the 3 or the 9, whichever you're dividing by. So 27 divided by 3 gives me 9 or... 9, or sorry, 27 divided by 9 gives me 3. Make sure that you're writing the number above the 7. Because if you wrote the 9 above the 2, that would mean 2 divided by 3 gives me 9. And that's not correct. We're dividing by 27. So make sure that your answer just goes above the second number, the number in the ones place. All right, see if you can finish the worksheet here using the same patterns for multiplication, putting the biggest number last, and for division, using that number first. We have used all of the different types of division signs here, and so you'll just be using them again. So if you you get confused and you're like, well, I don't remember what to do with this division sign, look up here and figure out where did I put the biggest number? And then does it matter where you put the other two smaller numbers? No, you're going to get a fact family either way. So if I had written here, maybe you wrote on your paper, nine divided or 27 <laughs> divided by nine is three. That's still correct. You just make sure that at the bottom, you'd put your, uh, you'd put the other two numbers opposite. So it doesn't matter if you wrote it exactly like mine. So for example, for this one, if you wrote nine times three and this one, you wrote three times nine, it's still correct. It doesn't matter. You just need to make sure you have both, um, both equations. So that way we can see all of the facts in the same family. Okay, let's take a look at the back side. So all you're doing is you're gonna just be practicing your division. So dividing by threes, fours, and ones. Why don't we go ahead and start with the ones since that is the easiest one. What happens when we divide a number by one? Does anybody remember? So if I say six divided by one, meaning I have six and I'm gonna put them all into groups of one, how many groups will I have? I'm gonna have six groups, right? Um, so same thing for all the rest of these. And then the opposite for multiplication is true too. So I could say six times one is six, six divided by one is six. So this is where it gets a little bit different here. How about eight divided by one? I could count by eight one time, or I can count by ones and stop when I get to eight and see how many ones I have. So same thing, you're just gonna have eight. So for one, when we're dividing by one, it's just gonna be that opposite number 
as your answer, right? So five divided by one, five. Three divided by one, three. Nine divided by one, nine, and so on. So just go ahead and fill that in. So that should be the easiest column to do. How about for our threes for division? So if I have 30 divided by three, how do I do division? I don't remember, explain it to me. What am I gonna do? We take the smallest number, we count by that number, and we stop when we get to the biggest number. However many of times we have to count the small number, that's our answer. So very similar to multiplication, except in division, we know the total number, we're stopping when we get to that number. So if I have three here, I'm gonna count by threes, and I'm gonna stop when I get to 30 and see how many threes it took me to get there. So let's see, I have three, six, nine, 12, 15, so there's five threes already. I have 18, 21, 24, 27, 30. How many threes do I have here? I have 10. 10 would be my answer. Let's do another one. I have 18 divided by three. If you were not able to explain how to divide up here, explain it to me now. How do I divide in this problem? Remember, pause the video at any time if you need to give an explanation. I'm gonna take the three. I'm gonna count by threes. Stop when I get to 18. However many threes I have, that's my answer, okay? So I have three, six, nine, 12, 15. There's five threes, 18. How many threes was that? Six, that's my answer. And if you're not sure, you could check your answer by multiplying backwards. So you do 10 times three is 30. Six times three is 18. If the sentence works, if, if it's a correct multiplication sentence, you're correct. But let's say I put the answer was five and I went five times three is 18. I would know that's incorrect, right? Because it's, um, that five times three isn't 18. Five times any number is going to give you a zero or a five in the ones place, and 18 doesn't follow that pattern. So you can always check by multiplying. Same thing over here. Six times one is six. Eight times one is eight. Same thing. Zero times one is zero. So you can always check by using that opposite operation. So let's go ahead and do the next one. So we have six divided by three. I'm gonna count by threes. I'm gonna stop when I get to six and see how many threes I used. Three, six, that's two threes. How about 24 divided by three? And now let's try to think of it the opposite way. Let's try to think three times what gives me 24? Well, we know it's not gonna be six because three times six gives me 18. And we know it's not gonna be 10 because three times 10 gives me 30. It's gonna be in between six and 10. What is my answer going to be? Eight, right? Three times eight gives me 24. How about, let's think of this one. Three times what gives me 12? Four. Three times what gives me three? One. And if we think about this, you take the smallest number, they're both the same. You count by that number and stop when you get to the other number. So I have three and I'm stopping when I get to three. How many threes do I have? Only one. All right. Um, so see if you can do the rest on your own and try to do um, whichever one of these worked best for you. So if you had to Take the small number, count by it until you get to bi the bigger number, and then count up how many you use. Do that. If it was easier for you to do three times what gives me the other number, do it that way. So whatever's easiest for you, go ahead and fill them in. If you've already memorized your division facts, then just write them in if you have them that way too. All right, let's take a look at the fours and let's do the same thing, starting by counting by fours, and then we'll do thinking of four times what gives me. The answer. Okay, so I'm going to take the small number. I'm going to count by it uh, until I get to the big number. See how many fours I have. So I have four, eight, 
12. I have one, two, three, fours. My answer is three. How do I check my answer again if I'm dividing? I just make it go backwards as a multiplication problem. So I could go three times four equals 12. Is it correct? It is, which means our division answer is correct. How about this one, four divided by four? I'm gonna count by fours, stop when I get to four. How many fours do I have? One, perfect. Next one, 36 divided by four. Count by fours, stop when I get to 36. Count up how many fours I had. I'm gonna go ahead and just put three out now because I know that'll give me 12, right? Use what you've already done to, to start figuring it out. So that gives me 12. And then I'm gonna go 16, 20, 24, 28, 32, 36. How many fours do I have? I have three, six, seven, eight, nine. My answer is nine. Remember, you can also skip ahead in the video. If you've already, you know how to divide by threes, fours, and ones, if you've already figured all this out, then just move on to the next page. This is just for anybody who's still kind of struggling with division that needs some strategies to use. So for the next three, we're gonna use our strategy of going four times what gives me 16. Hopefully you remember four times four gives me 16. What's another way to say four times four that we learned? Hopefully you said four squared because that's the same thing as saying four times four. How about four times what gives me 28? Four times seven, right? Four times what gives me 20? Five, nice job. All right, see if you can figure out the rest on your own. And then all you're gonna do here is you're gonna practice dividing. And I believe you are timed on this one. Let me check for how long. Oh, yes, not. This one you aren't timed on. So for the classwork, this is the same exact thing that we did on this page here. See if you can fill this out by just remembering. How many can you do that you just remember? Because these are all the same as what we did on the back page, okay? And then on the back here is where you're timed. And notice that these are all multiplication facts and you're gonna be timed for five minutes. So see how much you can do. We're trying to, the reason we're doing these tests is not to freak you out. I know some of you guys get really worried about being timed. Take some deep breaths before that you start the timer to calm yourself down if that's the case. All we're trying to do is make sure that you're improving. That's it. We just want you to do better than the last time. So if you improving means you did this in seven minutes and last time you did it in eight minutes, that's improvement and that's amazing. Even if you don't get it in the time that we're asking for. We just want you to be quick. That's it. And we want you to get faster and faster. But that's all. Okay. So don't worry about being timed and it being multiplication. Okay, last thing we're gonna do today is our guided fact practice. So our worksheet that we do the same every day. Let's take a look. So starting out by measuring the date line using inches, I'm gonna line myself up and I have two is my whole number. What would my fraction be if here are my three long lines? Two and three quarters of an inch. Does anyone remember how we write this using a decimal? 2.75 inches. Remember, because why? What do we, something about quarters. We talked about quarters. Three quarters equals 75 cents. All right, take a look at number one. Jolisha bought two bookmarks and a folder at the school store. How much did she spend? So we have bookmarks, she bought two, and a folder, she bought one. Did she buy any markers? No, so let's just cross that off. So we wanna know how much she spent, and we need to know what she bought. She bought two bookmarks and a folder. So that's the information we're gonna use to solve the problem. So what would my number sentence look like? And you can do this a couple different ways. If I wanna know how much total money she spent, what am I gonna do here? What's one of your ideas? Or maybe you have two different ideas. 
So we could do 45 cents because she bought one folder. And then how many bookmarks did she buy? Two, right? So plus 10 cents, plus 10 cents. And we can get our answer that way. Is there a different way that we might get an answer? Maybe you just know 10 plus 10 is 20. So you did 45 plus 20 cents. That's fine too. So what would my answer be if I have 45 cents plus 10 plus 10? So I could go 45, 55, 65 cents. We're just counting by 10 starting at 45. So my answer is 65 cents. How could I write this in a different way? You can also write it like this. And then what will be her change from $1? So we'll do $1 over here, 65 cents underneath. Can I take five away from zero? Absolutely not. Can I borrow from a neighbor who doesn't have anything? Can't do that either. Go take one away from here. My neighbor now has 10, but they know that I need something. So they're gonna take one away, giving them nine and me 10. 10 minus five is five. Nine minus six is three. Let's bring down my decimal point. Zero up there and there's my dollar sign. So you would get back 35 cents. How could I check my answer by adding? Cover up the top and add these numbers together. Five plus five is 10. Drop my zero, carry my one. Six plus three plus one is 10. So that would be $1. All right. Write 6,250 in expanded form. If you weren't able to do this yesterday, explain to us how do we do expanded form? What do I need to do here? I'm gonna take every digit and I'm going to just put zeros behind it and add it all up, right? So I have six in the thousands place plus two hundreds plus 50. And then if you wanna write plus zero, you can, or you don't have to, either way is fine by me. If you wanna write equals 6,250, you can, if you don't want to, you don't have to do that either. I usually just do it in the shortest way. Okay, now we're going to do the opposite. We're going to write 258,609 using digits. So we have 258, 258, and then 1,000. So I'm going to put a comma, 609. So what do I need to do here to write 609? What do I have in the tens place if I'm writing 609? Nothing, right? 258,609, and we are using digits for that. All right, number three, circle the letters that have parallel line segments. What was a parallel line again? These are parallel lines. They run forever in the same direction and they never touch. So where do you see parallel lines here? Do, you, are, do we have parallel lines in the F? We do, right? They're this way, these two are parallel. How about in the L? Nope, not at all. What about the N? We do, we have two parallel lines going that way. And then do we have any parallel lines in the X? Unfortunately, we do not. So we just circled these two. All right. Remember, with Saxon math, we are constantly reviewing things. So right now, we need to write $35,210.63 as you would on a check. If you can't fit it all on this line, go ahead and just write it underneath. That's fine, too. All right. So starting with writing 35. And what do we call and what is the little mark we put between 35? a hyphen, right? Remember, not for the teens, but for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. If you have a number that comes in the ones place afterward, you have to put a hyphen in between the number in the tens place and the number in the ones place. So we have 35,000, 200, 10 dollars, and then what do we do with the change? Does anyone remember? 35,210, we do 63 
over, what's my denominator? 100, perfect. And why is it that way? Why do we do 63 over 100? Where does this 100 come from? It's the total number of cents in a dollar, right? It would be 100 pennies. You're taking 63 pennies out of 100 pennies. And that is how we write your change on a check. All right, we're almost finished. This was a pretty quick um, guided class practice worksheet. And then we'll be done with our packet and we'll move on to the next packet tomorrow. So we're using this bar graph to answer our questions. And before we get started on the questions, what are we counting by in this bar graph? We have zero, two, four, six, eight, ten. 10. Counting by twos, right? So if I were to, if something were to land right in the middle of one of the numbers, what number would that be? It would be as if you're counting by one. So you'd have zero, one, two. If something landed in the middle here, that would be three, four. If something landed in the middle here, that would be five, right? So if you put a little dash in the middle of each box, that would mean um, you just go up by one since we're counting by twos on the side here. How many children have blue eyes? So how do I solve this problem? What do I do if I need to use this graph to figure this out? I'm gonna find blue. I'm gonna take a look at where I'm at. It looks like I'm right in the middle here. So if I'm between six and seven, what's my answer for how many children have blue eyes? Ooh, did I say six and seven? I meant six and eight. <laughs> if I'm between six and eight, what's my answer for how many children have blue eyes? Seven, right? How about the next one? How many children are in room 20? Well, we don't have a room 20 down here. All we have are different colors of eyes. But these are all the different colors of eyes of the children in room 20. So how could I solve this problem? If I wanna know how many children in total there are in room 20, what do I need to do with all of, oh my gosh. Well, that's embarrassing. I just dropped my phone. But <laughs> what am I going to do with all of the, um, the data that I have in this chart? So we already know that there's seven children that have blue eyes. And then how many children have green eyes? Four. And this goes right along with our chart. And then how about brown? If I'm right in between the eight and the ten here, that would be nine. And then how many children have hazel? just one. So now I know for each eye color, how many children have that eye color. So what do I do with this information? If you said add it all up, you're absolutely correct. Let's start by seeing if we can make any tens. So I have nine and one give me 10. I have seven and four left over. So I can do now seven plus four plus 10. Um, and that'll give me my answer. So what is seven plus four anyways? 11, so now I have 11 plus 10 equals 21. So there are a total of 21 children in room 20. How about for the next part? How many children do not have brown eyes? Now, how do I figure this out? I know that nine children have brown eyes. Do I want that number in my total? if I wanna know how many children do not have brown eyes. I don't, so then I'm just gonna add the rest of the numbers together except for the number for brown. So that would mean seven plus four plus one. And what would my answer be? We already did seven plus four is 11, right? Down here, plus one more is 12. Nice job. Whew, all right, let's take a look at the last question about this chart. How many more children have brown eyes than have green eyes? So there's nine children have brown, four children have green. Aren't you glad we wrote these all down here because we've had to use this again and again now. What am I gonna do with the nine and four if I'm looking for the difference between the children that have brown eyes and the children that have green eyes? This time I'm gonna subtract. So we'll do nine minus four. And what is my answer for nine minus four? Five, 
perfect. So now we are done with this chart. Remember, the back page, your homework page, is going to have the same thing on it, right? You have another chart and you have more questions. So if you have trouble or if you had trouble doing this now, make sure you come back and look at this um, so that way you can do the back side too. Okay, for number six, we're just filling in missing numbers. And we have different kinds of equations here, so they're trying to trick you with a lot of these. How about these two and the hundreds? How are we gonna solve these two problems? 32 plus what gives me 100? What plus 49 gives me 100? We're gonna just subtract the 32 and the 49 from the 100 to figure out what adds up to 100, right? So you may need a scratch paper if you have one, or you can write it out on here, 100 minus 32. So I, my neighbor has nothing, I have nothing. We're going all the way over to borrow. Neighbor gets 10, gives one to you, so now they have nine. 10 minus two gives me eight. Nine minus three gives me six. Bring your zero down. 32 plus 68 is 100. How could I check to make sure my answer was correct? Add these two up. If they equal 100, you're correct. If they don't, then you would be incorrect. We're doing the same thing for the next one. I have 100 minus 49. You could probably do this in your head if you really thought about it, right? Um, what's half of 100? 50, right? They have 49, so that's one less than 50. So I would guess 49 plus 51 would be 100, but let's check. So again, I have to go all the way over and borrow from my neighbor. My neighbor gets 10, but they're gonna give one to me, so now they have nine. 10 minus nine is one, nine minus four is five. So we have 51 plus 49 is 100. All right, how about this one? Three times what is equal to five times three? And you've probably seen problems like this on Mathletics. Three times what is equal to five times three? We're using the commutative property of multiplication here. So basically all you need to do is make sure you have the same numbers on each side. Notice we have a three on each side. What number is missing from this side that you have on this side? A five, so that's it. Three times five is the same thing as five times three. And to check your answer, you can solve each problem. Three times five is 15 and five times three is? 15, is 15 equal to 15? Yep, then your answer is correct. So then how would we do this problem? Knowing what we did to solve the problem up here, what am I gonna do here? Make sure you have the same numbers on each side, right? Because we're multiplying, we have the same operation and we see that we already have one number is the same, so the other one has to be the same too. So what number's missing from this side that we have over here? A three right? Commutative property of multiplication. And then how can I check to see that I'm correct? Solve each side. What's seven times three? 21. What's three times seven? 21. Is 21 equal to 21? It is. All right, then we're good. We can move on. Let's take a look at this one now. Now we're using addition. I have 23 plus 48 is equal to 48 plus something. Hmm, what am I going to do here? I am now gonna use the commutative property of addition, which is the same thing as the commutative property of multiplication. We're just using a different operation. So that means I'm gonna solve this in the same way. I'm gonna look what number's the same. We have a 48 on both sides. So then what number's missing from this side? 23, right? Then if I wanted to solve this problem, I'd do 23 plus 48. I'm running out of room here. Doing a lot of work today, huh? Eight plus three is 11, four plus two is six, so we'd have 71. And then I would do the same thing on the other side. I'd put 48 plus 23. Again, I get 11 and I get seven. So I'd say 71 is equal to 71. My answer is correct. All right, whew, last one. 17 plus what is equal to 56 plus 17? I'm adding, I have 17 on both sides. What number's missing from this side? The 56. 
that's it. I'm not going to add them up again. I, I honestly, I'm exhausted after doing all this. Um, but if you want to check your answer, add 17 plus 56, write it here. Add 56 plus 17, write it there. If they're the same number, then you're correct. And I'm just going to tell you, you are correct. So you don't have to do that if you don't want to. <laughs> okay. Let's take a look at the back. Um, I'm going to read all the problems for you. If you don't need me to, then you can go ahead and move on. So last problem in the, or last page in our packet, Leanna brought, I'm oh, sorry, Leanna bought two pencils and a marker at the school store. How much did she spend? You have pencil, folder, marker. You need a number sentence, an answer, and then tell me what her change will be if she gives you a dollar. Number two, write 3,148 in expanded form. Write 61,270 using digits. Number three, circle the letters that have parallel line segments. Number four, write $27,186.50 as you would on a check. Number five, use the bar graph to answer the questions. How many children have black hair? How many children are in room 15? How many children do not have blonde hair? How many more children have brown hair than have blonde hair? Here's your chart. Color of children's hair in room 15. Brown, blonde, red, black. At the bottom, fill in the missing numbers. What do you do if you come to a problem and you don't know how to do it? skip it, do it last. Once you finish and you came back to that problem um, and you still don't know how to do it, what should you do? Flip the paper over, find that number problem on the back, see if that'll help you do the problem. What do you do if you still don't know what to do after you take a look at the back? Rewatch the video, see if the video can help you kind of step by step go through it. Finally, what do you do if you still can't figure it out? Even after looking at the video, ask somebody around you for help. So remember, try to work as independently, meaning by yourself, as you can. But then if you still need help, make sure you get the help that you need. All right, guys, have a great rest of your day.